Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, well, it's not every, every day that you get to hear the, a whole book of the Bible. It's not really our text for today, but we read the whole book of Philemon, uh, which is appropriate because Paul really challenges um, uh, Philemon to change his outlook on, on major issues and on so the whole fabric of society itself. And uh, today we are looking at the issue of life as we look at the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, sometimes we are faced uh, with really difficult choices in life. Um, things that make you uh, toss and turn at night. Other times, okay. Other times we have choices that are really, really easy. Um, if someone offered you an all expenses paid trip, to the Caribbean or to the barren frozen tundra of Siberia, I think would be a pretty easy choice. Uh, technically, I have a choice every morning whether to eat breakfast or not. <laughs> but for me, that's a very easy choice. I'm going to eat breakfast. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Yahweh gives the Israelites a choice, but it's a really easy choice. It's a choice between following Yahweh or going alone. To put it another way, Yahweh asked whether his people wanted life or death. The choice was easy. Slavery in Egypt or living in the promised land. And throughout all the wilderness wandering, God had made it abundantly clear that following him meant life and abandoning him meant death. When the Israelites ran into enemies, Yahweh rescued them. Whatever Israel needed, bread, water, meat, strength, or a map, Yahweh provided it. On the other hand, those who defied had defied Yahweh and rebelled against his provisions and guidance were bitten by serpents, stricken with sickness, or swallowed up by the earth itself. It was pretty straightforward. Follow Yahweh, get life. Abandon him, get death. But just in case they'd missed 40 years worth of lessons, Yahweh reminds them once again. In fact, most of Deuteronomy is Moses reminding the Israelites of what they were supposed to do, follow Yahweh, and why they should, because he guarded and led them. I mean, at Deuteronomy, the Israelites are right on the cusp of going into the promised land, a land that is occupied by foreign nations. But the heart of Yahweh's message is not about governmental structure or military strategy or agricultural practices. The heart of Moses' instructions are, follow the Lord, do what he says, and he will do everything else. The reason Moses basically reviews the whole Torah in, the, in Deuteronomy is because the law uh, or the Torah, the, all the commandments, including the Ten Commandments, but hundreds of others, helps Israel in two simple ways. First, the law establishes boundaries for a healthy and stable society. Yahweh is the source of life, and he knows how we should treat one another and he knew what rules Israel needed. You want to know how to live? Well, why not try listening to the guy who is the source of all life? But really, more importantly, the law also provided a way for Israel to stay connected to Yahweh. The Torah not only commanded Israel how it should act, it told them what to do when they messed up and how to keep the lines of communication open and healthy. Well, God is the source of all life. And being disconnected from him inevitably, eventually, leads to death. God gives life. God gives life. Now, that might be a theological statement to a pastor or debatable religious history to some. It may be a belief 
for, for us, but to Israel, it was reality. It was what they experienced, following Yahweh out of death in Egypt to freedom and life in the promised land. God had given life to Israel even before they'd received the Torah and when Moses got it on Mount Sinai, when God called them and rescued them from slavery and a watery grave. Now he gives them the Torah. And the Torah, the laws, again, I'm just using Torah as the commandments and the covenant God gives to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. The Torah was intended to give life, but they would only receive life if they followed the Torah. I mean, that's nothing revolutionary here. That's just how instructions work. Instructions don't do you any good if you don't follow them, right? The reason we have instructions is to help us do difficult or new things. Whether this is a, I don't know if you can tell, it's Legos. Whether it's Legos or Ikea furniture, instructions help you put things together. But if you don't follow the instructions, the furniture won't get to put together properly. If a kid wants a fantastic Star Wars Lego set, he sees on the box, typically he can only accomplish it if he follows the instructions. And so, Moses exhorts, he threatens, and he pleads with Israel to follow these instructions. When we encounter something complicated, right, instructions can often help us. Well, life is complicated, and Israel's life was going to be complicated, and God's instructions were there to help them. And so God, Moses, and Yahweh are saying, please choose life. These instructions will help Israel to stay in a close and trusting relationship with the Lord. And in that way, they are life. Choose life, Yahweh says, not death. Choose the instructions I have given you. Well, they didn't. Israel did not choose life. Israel consistently and deliberately chose death by walking away from Yahweh. They disrespected and ignored both his promises and his instructions. They chose death, even though God didn't want them to. But God was not satisfied with this ending, so he had a better plan. And God sent his own son to choose death as well. Only this was very different. Jesus did not choose death because he rejected God or wanted to do things his way. Jesus chose death as a way to listen to his heavenly Father. Jesus came to the world, Jesus preached life, but the world called for his death. Don't give us Barabbas, give us death. Kill Jesus. But Jesus chose death for the exact opposite reason that the world chose it. And so, because he chose it for the exact opposite reason, it wound up having the exact opposite effect. The world, you and I, choose death by our disobedience. But Jesus chose death by his obedience to the Father's plan of salvation. We die because we rebel. But Jesus died because he listened. And that is a reminder that God is what we might call pro-life. He still pleads, choose life, not death. Because God always wants life for his people. Ezekiel tells us, uh, well, several places, and Ezekiel is the quote, but it comes up in the New Testament, God desires not the death of the sinner. God created life. Death is not what he ever wants but always a result in whatever form it comes of a perversion and the curse of sin, this broken world, and separation from God. God doesn't want, nor did he create anyone to experience death. And that certainly includes the unborn, but hardly covers it. God loves life and despises death. Full stop. But we can't come to a full stop, certainly, with the life of an infant. God doesn't just want us to be pro-babies being born, but calls us to be champions for the life of all. He sent Jesus, 
who is the life of the world. And you cannot have, none of us, no matter what age, no matter how big or small we are, none of us can have life apart from him. There is no true life apart from him who is the resurrection and the life. Pro-life in a truly Christian sense does not mean a political cause. It means choosing the way of Jesus, because Jesus is life. Ultimately, what Christians want is not the change of one law or even a whole raft of laws. We want something bigger than that, something much more holistic. We want people to experience the life that Jesus alone can give. Because true life, as Jesus references in our gospel lesson, true life um, can only uh, be found in emptying ourselves and throwing ourselves upon Christ's mercy. And we fail to value life anytime we don't value the life of our neighbor. Whenever they become simply uh, an object or a means to an ends, we fail to value life when we encourage people to choose life but quickly forget about their needs once they are born. We fail to value life anytime we demonize or demean anyone, no matter what they have done. We choose death when we only value our lives and health and minimize the health and lives of those less fortunate. When we insult fellow human beings, Jesus calls this murder. We must repent because we all prefer our way over the way of Jesus. If we think biblically, we, uh, none of us is truly pro-life because we are daily choosing death over life. Me over you, my desires that lead to destruction and war, or choosing God's desires that lead to life and peace. Whenever we choose our wants and comfort over the needs of others, we choose death. We must repent uh, because we have all fallen short of the glory of God. But remember, God chooses life. God chooses life even when we have chosen death because his grace is bigger than our transgressions. And we can see Jesus' commitment to life. It can be seen in the cross where Jesus dies for sinners, not for people who followed his rules, but for those who chose death. And his victory is in the empty tomb. The only way anyone can receive life is through Jesus, through repentance and forgiveness. In our weakness, we must admit, we often choose death when we sin and ignore God. But Jesus has come that you may have life and have it to the full. And we find life in the mercy of God's Son. We find life in the way of Jesus, a way of repentance and forgiveness, a way that teaches us that the only true path to life comes in mercy, forgiveness, and the cross of Christ. Being pro-life is really a posture, an attitude. It's a lifestyle that champions life in all sorts of ways and points humanity to its only hope found in the life of Christ. The hope found in the forgiveness and in God's great work through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.